Professional wrestling is a world of accounts of stories of over-the-top victories of athletes combating adversities and winning titles. It also has its share of shocking tragedies such as the Von Erichs, Owen Hart, Mike Awesome, and the Grams. You've probably heard the saying, there are always three sides to every story, and somewhere in the middle lies the truth. When it comes to the tragedies of Eddie and Mike Graham, it's anyone's guess what really happened. The wrestling business is filled with individuals who are gone that can no longer defend themselves from analysis and allegations, and the ones that are still around frequently exploit this by trying to put themselves over while they can. A father and son who lived their lives during completely different generations, but yet had countless similarities. On January 21, 1985, it was reported Eddie Graham had taken his own life. His grandson Stephen took his own life on December 14, 2010, and Mike Graham committed suicide in a similar manner on October 19, 2012. This is a story of the various theories surrounding the deaths of Eddie and his son Mike Graham. Eddie Graham, whose real name Edward Gossett, and who early in his career in Texas wrestled under the name Rip Rogers, became known in the Northeast in the late 1950s as part of a top-rated tag team with his brother, Dr. Jerry Graham, known as the Golden Grahams or the Graham Brothers. They found huge success in Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C., and other territories of capital wrestling, which was a precursor to the WWF. Dr. Jerry Graham, was Vincent K. McMahon's favorite wrestler. As a teenager in the late 1950s, McMahon would dye his hair blonde to emulate Graham and even dress like him. The very prestigious US tag team titles became theirs on several occasions until 1960 when Eddie left for Florida. Jerry Graham, wielding a hunting knife and a sawed off shotgun, would later attempt to steal his mother's dead body from the hospital shortly after she passed away. Other members of this kayfabe family included Crazy Luke and later superstar Billy Graham. When Eddie was in the New York area, he became one of the most popular and wealthiest wrestlers of that era. The Graham brothers, Dr. Jerry and Eddie Graham, tried to stave off Antonio Roca and Miguel Perez during wrestling's golden era. Anytime anyone ever talked about wrestling, Bill Apter once said, Eddie Graham's name always came up. If you came to New York and talked about wrestling in the 1950s or 60s, the Graham brothers were the first names they mentioned. Eddie's further success in tag team wrestling was obtained in Florida with partners Sam Steamboat, Bob Orton Sr., and Big Ike Eakins. Eddie also became a two-time Southern Heavyweight Champion for the NWA in 1962 and 63. In 1968, Eddie Graham, who was already blind in one eye since birth, just barely escaped death in a locker room when a 75-pound steel window fell on his head at Tampa's Fort Hesterly Armory, causing both his retinas to be torn. Other sources claim they had become detached. The injury required him to get 300 stitches on his face and head. He was ultimately awarded $23,000 by the Florida State Legislature for the damages caused and was out of action for 15 months. In the early 1970s, he became a majority owner and bought into the Florida Territory, formerly owned by his trainer, Cowboy Bob Luttrell. There he took charge of championship wrestling from Florida's promoting and booking. He did bring in others to help him with booking from time to time, but Eddie always had the final say. Eddie Graham developed professional and amateur wrestling in the Sunshine State like nobody before and nobody since by generously donating vast sums of money for amateur wrestling camps, youth organizations, and various scholarships for universities in the Tampa, Florida area. Eddie saw how important little things could change the lives of youngsters in the community from a very young age. As a young kid growing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, he would sell newspapers, and the newspaper in turn gave them all free memberships to the YMCA as a gift. 
Without that help, he would never have been able to afford it. This is also how he began lifting weights and was exposed to wrestling, where at 14 he met Latrell, who was a hated heel until later getting into promoting in the Florida Territory. His first match was at age 17, and Eddie got paid with no money but a turkey. His father was not supportive of his wrestling because he didn't believe there was any money in it, but his mother backed him wholeheartedly. With his wrestling career winding down, he teamed with his son Mike and together they won the Florida and Georgia versions of the tag team titles while he himself stayed active until 1980. The father and son team of Eddie and Mike Graham battled Dick Slater and Pac Song in 1974. Eddie Graham's colleagues demonstrated how much they respected his mind for the business by electing him president of the NWA from 1976 to 78. With the territories thriving during his tenure, he was also instrumental in the historic unification title bouts between WWWF world champion superstar Billy Graham and NWA world champion Harley Race. At the time, the event held at the Orange Bowl in Miami was called the Super Bowl of Wrestling. And after a 60-minute bout, it ended in a controversial draw in front of a reported 12,000 fans under stormy conditions. With Gorilla Monsoon and Don Curtis as referees, the third fall began with the bout tied at one fall apiece. Superstar Billy Graham, with his shoulders pinned on the mat and clearly not responding due to racist sleeper hold, was literally saved by the bell after Curtis counted to only one before the time limit expired. Once his in-ring career was over, Eddie Graham focused on his charitable organizations, real estate deals, and the Florida Territory's continual promotion. In terms of population, the whole state was going through a growth spurt. This is when, according to his son Mike, his father saw the writing on the wall that spelled doom for the territory and the business he had loved. The 1980s is when the continuous squabbling and backstabbing amongst the power-hungry owners of the different NWA territories finally caught up with them. A young upstart by the name of Vincent K. McMahon in 1982 acquired Capital Wrestling from his father and split from the NWA. He decided to take his product national while disregarding the regional agreements held by the NWA owners since 1948. With the various territories collapsing and closing operations, one of the final strongholds of the weakened NWA became the Carolinas under Jim Crockett Promotions, led by Jim Crockett Jr or Jimmy as he was referred to by Mike Graham. He also had a vision of a national product, but at the expense of using surviving territories like Florida as an unofficial farm system, where he would lure Dusty Rhodes, Barry Windham, Lex Luger, and Ron Bass to his promotion in Charlotte. By now he was referring and promoting it as the NWA as if his partners didn't exist. Magnum TA was also a key star that left Florida, but had a brief but memorable stint in Bill Watts' Mid-South before heading to Charlotte. According to Mike Graham in a kayfabe commentary shoot interview, Dusty Rhodes leaving Florida may have been the territory's death blow. Meanwhile, the WWF continued to purge the NWA and AWA of its stars to stem the tide in its favor further. On July 14, 1984, to the horror of many fans and what would later be called as Black Saturday, the WWF took over the time slot on Superstation WTBS that once belonged to Georgia Championship Wrestling. By all accounts, Georgia was easily one of the top territories of the NWA. A now megastar named Hulk Hogan began to run wild in arenas and televised screens across the country. This made for TV Muscle Man, who urged the chants of fans while ripping his t-shirt off to the theme of Eye of the Tiger, seemingly threatened the other wrestling companies with his leg drop finisher as if to put an end to their futile attempts of recovering their once dominant territories. The WWF was moving at breakneck speed and permanently sprinting ahead of the wrestling race as if it were a race between a tortoise and a hare. With no respect for the old guard, Vince McMahon was destined to end the territory system. During all of this, Eddie Graham took his own life at the age of 55 on January 21, 1985 with a self-inflicted gunshot to the temple using a large caliber revolver. In a shoot interview conducted by Kayfabe Memories, his son Mike believed that various factors including financial, personal troubles with his girlfriend, and his long struggle with alcohol may have led his father to taking his own life. After his father's passing and the circumstances wrestling was in, it would have been almost impossible for anyone to keep the CWF afloat. 
Mike wound up selling his interest to Jim Crockett Jr. in 1987 and later got hired as a trainer and a booker for WCW. Bill Apter, who met Graham in 1971, says that Graham killed himself in a period of change that I don't think he would have been happy to live through. I think he would believe there's too much of the showbiz entertainment. Eddie always sold wrestling. In wrestling business terms, Mike's father perhaps saw the writing on the wall and foresaw the continued crumbling and eventual sinking of the NWA at the hands of the future juggernaut of wrestling, the WWF. Now a global corporation that goes by the name of World Wrestling Entertainment, this monster of sports entertainment had over $975 million in revenues in 2020, with the vast majority coming from its media library. Terry Funk recalls Eddie not having a lot of formal education, but became a self-made individual who learned to fly planes and captain boats. Graham saw Dory Funk and Amarillo become heavily involved in the community, and in turn, many opportunities and business opened for him. Graham tried to replicate this in Florida and became a very successful business owner and respected community entrepreneur. In his book, Terry Funk, More Than Just Hardcore, he further states, Eddie had a great mind for the business and a great feel for the fans. He had a great mind for the manipulation and continuation of what you would call storylines today. He was very ahead of his time in terms of how he promoted. When someone becomes very powerful and influential, they always have defenders and detractors. Former NWA world champion Rugged Ronnie Garvin agreed that Eddie had an excellent business mind. However, in a shoot interview with Hannibal TV, he stated Eddie Graham as a human being was a piece of shit. He'd pilot his plane while drunk. Garvin would speculate about Eddie's suicide and mention that he had a girlfriend at the time, even though he was married. Five or six years after Eddie's death, his son Mike showed Garvin a check for $600,000 after selling land for the Florida Sheriff Boys Ranch his father had owned. Ronnie further stated, even with all that money, Mike still wasn't happy. The assassin Jody Hamilton remembers a time when Eddie Graham didn't do so well in business and troubles were starting to brew. He recounts from his book Assassin, shortly after I took over the book in Florida, Eddie Graham and Buddy Fuller went to Australia and took their girlfriends with them. They had just bought the promotion in Australia from Jim Barnett and were convinced they would take the country by storm. Eddie told us, we're going to quadruple the business that Barnett did. Of course, history shows that they failed and lost their entire investment. Hamilton further states, there's a lot of bickering going on in the office between the partners. While I was trying to conduct business, the partners would all be in Eddie's office, hollering, screaming, yelling and arguing. When times were good, the business was booming, there was no problems. But when business slowed down, Eddie would go to them and say, the partners all need to cough up some money and get us through this slump. You have to come up with a specific amount of money which is based on your percentage of the towns you own. Jody Hamilton also admits that Eddie made huge contributions to Florida, amateur wrestling and the youth. Still, even though he was knowledgeable and had great ideas, the alcohol could often cloud his judgment. In a shoot interview with Hannibal TV, Kevin Sullivan admitted he got caught up with the wrong people. With so many stories on Eddie's death, there's a little truth in all of them. Sullivan agrees with Jody that Eddie had a brilliant mind for the business, but alcoholism was one of his demons that sometimes led him to make bad decisions. He claims that Eddie had been sober for 13 years but fell off the wagon while on a fishing trip with himself and his son Mike. He further states that Eddie believed he was smart and never thought he could be conned. Eddie supposedly knew a person in the political scene who was also part of the planning department. Rumors are that he invested a lot of money based on illegal inside information from this person. Once fired, there was a fear that he'd be exposed. It would have been an embarrassing situation for him in the community. Add to this the problems of him having a girlfriend while he was married. This theory about the real estate deal gone wrong is one that superstar Billy Graham also believes had something to do with Eddie's suicide. Eddie had worked his whole life to portray a decent image of a respected person in the community. This alleged fraud would have been the end of him and would face probable jail time if convicted, according to superstar Billy Graham. Kevin Sullivan further speculates that maybe Eddie had health issues because his body had changed. He doesn't toss out the possibility that alcohol had something to do with it. Dutch Mantel, who was hired to book Florida in 1984, recalls Eddie always tense and troubled. He remembered not being able to talk to Eddie to pick his brain because he was always on the phone with someone at the office. He too believed the rumor of the real estate with a shady background to it, as one of the main catalysts of Eddie deciding to take his own life. 
along with the business being down in Florida with all the talent that had gone to the Carolinas. California-based psychiatrist Dr. David Reese, CEO of Beyond Wellness Talent Protection, comments, Theoretically, many factors may have contributed to Eddie's suicide, including chronic depression, alcoholism, long-term effects of the acute head injury, as well as possible chronic pain or additional effects of minor head injuries related to Eddie's wrestling career. We can only speculate how these factors affected Eddie's behavior and relationship with Mike, but there had to have been a significant impact. Graham made contributions to a number of charitable causes as chief of the Florida Boys and Girls Ranch Villa. In 1957, Graham, Cowboy Latrell, and Hillsborough Sheriff Ed Blackburn began efforts to establish the organization. Graham donated funds from every championship wrestling from Florida show to the villa, bringing in a reported $100,000, also donating to a high school and college level amateur wrestling events. On January 21, 1985, after a night of heavy drinking mixed with prescription pills, was sitting on his bed sipping coffee. It was late morning, a few days after his 55th birthday, and he had not slept well. He looked terrible. For a month or more, the usually vivacious Eddie Graham had been withdrawn. He wasn't going into the office every day and would hardly say a word during dinner. On his 50th birthday, he had been celebrated in a big benefit attended by Tampa politicians and business leaders. This year, for his 55th, he stayed home. He didn't even want to go around the corner to visit his grandchildren who adored him. Lucy Gossett knew something was bugging her husband, but she wasn't sure what. In the last few months, she said, he was always deep in thought, very quiet, wouldn't talk. I'm sure the grandchildren noticed it too. That morning, I had just gotten up I asked Eddie if he wanted to go to Biscuits to get some chicken, and he said no. He asked me if I'd made coffee, and I said yes. And so I went on, and I didn't even stay there, I just came back home. And he was just real nervous. He was white, just white. And he was sitting beside the bed drinking his coffee, and he never did that. He always went into the family room, drank his coffee, and read the paper. Then the phone rang. It was a friend with some extra vegetables from her garden. I went back into the bedroom, and I said, Eddie, I'll be right back. And he says, okay. He says, you can fix me some breakfast when you get back. She was gone just 15 minutes. It was that quick, she says. While his wife was out, Eddie went into another room where he kept a cabinet stocked with several rifles and handguns. He removed a five shot, 38 caliber, blue steel Smith & Wesson revolver, inserted one bullet, returned to the bedroom and lay face up on the bed dressed only in his underwear. He put the gun to his right temple and pulled the trigger. When I opened the door, I heard this gurgling I went in there and he was on the bed. He had shot himself, says his wife. He was still breathing. An ambulance rushed him to St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa, where he died a few hours later. Afterwards, when Mike went through his father's papers, he would find notes that Eddie had written to himself during those weeks and months of brooding. Only then did his family begin to realize what he had been going through. Mike won't share the notes, but he says it may hold a clue to why his father ended his own life. I've been con, one note read, and the embarrassment is too much to stand. By any measure, Eddie Graham was a success. He was born poor, had worked hard, reached the top of his field, achieved fame and wealth and respect. His marriage lasted 35 years, surviving lean years and life on the road. He had a son who followed in his footsteps and who gave him two fine grandchildren. In some ways though, he was two people. One the fan saw, tough, brutal, mean. The other his friend saw, tough, yet but soft inside, a gentle, kind man who loved practical jokes. Graham's participation in a land deal gone wrong led him to needing to raise over $500,000, including financial and marriage problems contributed to his death. I'm aware of the bonds that were created today. On October 18, 2012, at the age of 61, Mike Graham, whose real name was Edward Michael Gossett, committed suicide just like his father by way of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head in Daytona Beach, Florida while attending an annual event for motorcycle enthusiasts called Biketoberfest. Mike's son Stephen Edward Gossett at the age of 37 also took his own life the same way at the same event two years earlier in 2010. 
Kevin Sullivan claims after all these deaths, he found out that Eddie's father, Mike's grandfather, also committed suicide. And Eddie had a brother with terminal cancer who also took his own life. Sullivan remembers Mike saying once to him, Jerry Briscoe and a couple of other friends after both his father and late son had passed away, I must have been a horrible son and a horrible father. Sullivan continued, Mike went downhill after his son died and wasted away to nothing. Sullivan also recalls a chilling phone call after Mike's final ever guest on his radio show, Talking Wrestling with Mike Graham. Afterward, he was strangely emotional and told Kevin that he loved him. Six days later, Mike killed himself. According to the Post and Courier with Mike Mooneyham, in a haunting similar phone call from Eddie Graham to his son before killing himself after Super Bowl Sunday in 1985, he also called his son Mike to remind him that he loved him. Although it can be said that Mike Graham had success in pro wrestling compared to so many others that have laced up the boots and entered the squared circle, he never became a major star and certainly didn't reach the heights that his father Eddie did. Mike entered the sport against his mother Lucy's wishes as she did not want Mike's wife to go through what she did during Eddie Graham's career in which many times he had been injured or come home bloodied. She was also aware of the dismaying task Mike would have trying to live up to the Graham family name his father had established. In the long run, it seems like his short statue also became a huge obstacle in getting the big push he needed in wrestling. So much that Dusty Rhodes in a shoot interview with Stone Cold Steve Austin says that he became Eddie's wrestling son because certain limitations Mike had such as his height. The 16-time world champion nature boy Ric Flair is quick to defend his former friend. Mike Graham was tough as they come, a phenomenal performer who never got the recognition he deserved because he was considered too small to be a championship contender. His reputation was legit for his size and he was very tough. Famed play-by-play -play announcer Gordon Soley respected Mike's gutsiness and fortitude in the ring, and he stated he'd go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a buzzsaw and give it the first two rounds. Before wrestling professionally, Mike was a three-time state AAU collegiate wrestling champion and a state champion at the 154-pound weight class. As a sophomore, he defeated a senior named Richard Blood, who later became Ricky Steamboat. Mike was also an accomplished powerlifter who set state records in the bench press. Former NWA world champ Dory Funk recalls young Mike Graham would take on all comers to see if they had the skill and credibility to become a pro wrestler. Mike did this along with Japanese shooter Hiro Mitsuda, Bob Roop, the Briscoe brothers Jack and Jerry at the infamous Snake Pit Gym located at the Tampa Sportatorium. At the time of Mike's death, he was wearing his son's old work boots. In Mike's case, comments Dr. Reese, it appears that the most compelling factor was the suicide of his son in 2010. In the incident report, his wife comments that after the suicide of their son, Mike threatened to commit suicide on several occasions. Studies also show that parents' behavioral traits can pass to their children as a predisposition towards alcohol and addiction. In a kayfabe commentary shoot interview with Jim Cornette, Kevin Sullivan stated that Eddie told him that he got divorced in Amarillo, Texas from his wife Lacey when Mike was around two or three years old, but because he loved his boy so much, he stuck with her. He says that after a couple years Eddie died, Mike found out and confronted Sullivan on why he didn't tell me he had known. Now things started to fall in place for Mike. He realized that maybe he was too hard on his father. There were times when he didn't get along with him, but Eddie usually got along fine with Kevin. Bill Watts offered, the suicide was more understandable with Eddie because of the things that he was doing, but with Mike, you never saw it coming. On a biochemical basis, says Dr. Reese, recent studies have found that stress of any childhood trauma causes chemical changes in the brain that are associated with the risk of depression and suicide. Though their high standards in the ring, Eddie and Mike Graham should be remembered for their positive contributions to wrestling. They left the sport better than they had entered it. More importantly though, Eddie Graham left behind a better world through his civic work and helped shape many youths that now as adults surely appreciate all he did. But sadly, the tragic way their lives ended will be discussed for generations to come by fans and non-followers of the grappling game alike. Eddie Graham was inducted into the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame in 1996 and inducted posthumously into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2008 by Dusty Rhodes with his son Mike Graham accepting the offer on his father's behalf. Mike Graham was a 16-time NWA Florida Tag Team Champion with various partners. He was awarded the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Rookie of the Year Award in 1972. He was also ranked number 100 in the PWI 500 for 1992.
That was the story of Eddie and Mike Graham. I'm aware of the bonds that were created today When you told me that sure there's a way The water's so still and my pain's gone away The air is much cleaner after 